Hello, 45 Alpha Charlie Papa channel, and today we're playing What the Hell Did the Gunsmith Drag Home This Time? <laughs> <laughs> Something nobody else wanted. Something nobody else wanted. Um, I thought this would be a great video. You know, he picked up something that you know, we'd love to get it back to uh, the original spec, but uh, we're going to talk about why that may not Probably, be possible. Yeah, it just may not be possible. So let's see. What did you bring home this well, time? Well, I was actually I didn't bring it home. It was shipped to it me shipped because to I bought it on a on an online auction. I haunt online auctions all the time, and uh, when I find something that interests me, I bid on it. And ninety nine percent of the time, I don't get it because it interests <laughs> yes. somebody else more yes. than it interests me. But this time, nobody else seemed to have wanted it. So I came across a barreled action. Remington Rolling Block. But it's not just a barreled action Remington Rolling Block, as there are so many of those around. This particular one is really a pretty rare one. This is an 1870 Springfield made under license to Remington. Mm -hmm. They actually paid Remington a dollar a piece for every one of these they made <laughs> on their license. Yes. True story. <laughs> yeah. A buck a piece. Um, and this was made for the U.S. Navy. It's got the little Navy stamp on the uh, top of the barrel. And on the side here, you probably can't read it from there, but it says uh, USN Springfield 1870. Uh, it is a uh, uh, Remington rolling block that is chambered in 5070. 5070. Which is the one before they, you know, made a hot rod out of it and made it 4570. <laughs> <laughs> reduced the reduced the diameter from 50 to 45, yeah, and I'm, it was I'm, a wildcat. Yeah, I'm sure some bean counter out there was saying, <laughs> yo, we can save X amount of brass. And, and, and not and, to mention the lead. And lead and material making the rifle by, you know, That's right. Just shortening it. Uh, That's making right. Making it smaller. Now, if, if uh, in this particular case, it's in pretty, you know, well-used, sad shape. These were made under contract to the United States Navy. Uh, first, they ran 10,000 of them. Um, and the Navy rejected them all. <laughs> now, why would that be? Every stinking one of them. Because the original design had the rear sight over the chamber. Mm. And they thought that would make them dangerous to use. So what do they do with them? What do you do with rejected rolling blocks? I don't know. What do you do with rejected rolling blocks? You sell them to France. <laughs> oh! France was in a war with, with Prussia, and the Franco-Prussian War was on, and the French said, sure, we'll take them. <laughs> And evidently, none of them blew up because we never did get a an international incident. But nonetheless, the Navy rejected them. So this is the this is the uh, uh, U.S. Navy 1870 Springfield II. <laughs> <laughs> Not that it says that on there. Anyway. Now, according but, to research, this was only made for one year. Yeah, 1870. And they made like twenty five thousand of them. One uh, of twenty five thousand. Yeah, one of twenty five thousand, and there probably aren't that many left. Uh, anyway, uh, you know, just things you happen on in the, uh, I wasn't shopping for this. I was looking at rolling blocks, but I lucked out on it and it, evidently nobody else knew what it was or cared one way or another what it was <laughs> because I'm just big on weird guns. So hey, anyway, maybe, maybe somebody did the research and thought, you know, can I find parts for that gun? And the answer is no. <laughs> <laughs> So as, that, you, as you can see, it didn't have a buttstock, and the foreign that it came with is is loose on here, um, uh, and it's broken and just in terrible condition. So I uh, I've gone out looking for parts for it, and good luck. Good luck. With only twenty five thousand of them made, there were only twenty five thousand parts to start with, yes. <laughs> and that was in eighteen seventy. Mm -hmm. So it's a long time ago. So this, anyway. is, this is kind of get to that point. To, what do you do with something like this if you want to make it a shooter? I mean, right now it's just sitting in a corner. It probably has been for years. Yeah. You know, rotting away. You've forgotten about. Nobody's, you know, no, hasn't done anything to it simply because parts aren't available. This is exactly. 150 years ago. Yeah. So so it's just, it's just sat there and probably passed from one guy to another as a project. And they mm -hmm. never got it done. And that's the way it was. Yeah. So, anyway. So, what are our choices here to get this into a shooter? Well, what we're going to have to do is we'll have to make a sporter out of it rather than <gasps> return it to military. 
I would much rather return it to military, but as I have gone out looking for parts, um, I found out just why it hasn't been <laughs> returned, re to military. returned to military. You will probably spend, if you do find the parts, more money on the parts that than I gun, spent on the gun. For sure. The gun for sure. would be worth as a mismatched yeah. rolling so, block. For, for example, I don't know how much you know about rolling blocks. There should be a little bow tie in here that holds these pins in so they don't fall out. I just found one. Mm -hmm. Spent $40 for this little piece of, of uh, um, sheet metal that's in a kind of a bow tie that clips over the end of these two pins and the out. screw that goes in there. 40 bucks. 40 bucks. That's what happens when you, when you buy this old lucky stuff. Lucky to find. Yeah, and I was lucky to find that. If you don't know anything about rolling blocks, let me, let me just give you a little bit of history on it without driving you crazy and, and making you fall asleep, hopefully. Uh, <laughs> first of all, they were, they, uh, you've heard of the Remington Ryder. Uh, Joseph Ryder, I think his name was, uh, was a Remington employee, was a designer. He designed this. And uh, uh, he started right at the end of the Civil War in 1865. By 1868, they had uh, uh, the design pretty much down pat, uh, and they started making prototypes and, and all mm -hmm. that other good stuff. But they were a single-shot cartridge gun compared to the muzzle loaders they had in the uh, Civil War. This was uh, pretty advanced stuff. Uh, as you know, they also had repeaters in the Civil War, but nobody uh, in the major militaries was ready to do that. No, most uh, of the guys that carried those bought them themselves. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, they uh, uh, they made this thing to be robust. <laughs> the mainspring looks like it came off of either a tractor or a truck. It's really hard to tell which. And if you listen to it, it sounds like <laughs> I mean when when that spring clicks that sucker home, it's home. It's home. <laughs> And uh, basically, the uh, uh, breech block rolls back. You put a 5070 shell in there. You close that. And the interaction between these two, if you'll notice, if it's not in battery all the way, the hammer won't fall because it will fall against the rolling block here and won't fire without it being totally in battery. So when it's totally in battery, there's clearance and it will close. Yeah, now, one thing you, you might ask, how come you just don't find other rolling block parts to to put in this? Well, because some of them were um, proprietary to this model. Mm -hmm. and you have to remember, Springfield's making this, not Remington. Yes, this is not the Remington. This is so not made of Remington. It's licensed through Remington, but they're making it to their spec. Yeah. Well, uh, it should be to Remington spec, but nonetheless, they didn't have any Remingtons there to check to see whether the parts were mm -hmm. interchangeable. But... Uh, um, again, uh, the rolling blocks became pretty popular out in the uh, uh, plains shooting buffalo. Everyone thinks the Sharps was the buffalo rifle, and it was. The 50, uh, uh, 100 Sharps was the, the big 50 and decimated a lot of buffalo herds. This was probably the second, uh, second most, yeah. uh, most, most used uh, of all of them in either 50 or 45, 70. Another uh, thing is that 1971, the Army contract. Yes, the Army contract. And they them. changed the mechanism. So yes. it's a one year. It's, it's a, a one, one year runoff. So, uh, yeah, it's not something you're just going to go find. And these, I just kind of put these uh, together a little bit so that I could hopefully pull them out and, and show you what I mean by it's a uh, robust design. Uh, the parts are, are huge. They're made to last forever. And this one has been a part, obviously, often enough to, that... Uh, uh, the, these screws don't even want to go in. Let's see if I can get them out without any help uh, from a pair of pliers. The one thing I will say is that I have been able to find the screws for these because the uh, threads and everything are the same as for the regular uh, uh, rolling blocks. Come on, get out of there. Them. All right, Just two long screws. The uh, uh, trigger guard comes out, 
and uh, you can see the what I always call the truck spring or the, the uh, main spring which looks like it came off of a John Deere tractor <laughs> or it could have been an international harvester tractor I suppose and then these two pins are with the uh, hammer and the breech block uh, roll on why well, it's called a rolling block and they will simply push out without that little uh, thing in there to tie them in. There's your uh, breech block. There's your hammer. And when I tell you this is a substantial, beefy, uh, well-made uh, rifle that was made for, um, uh, what do you call it, uh, peasants to uh, <laughs> shoot and not break, uh, that's why. It's not complicated. There's not that many pieces. I mean, that's pretty much... Except for the small parts, that's pretty much the gun. Uh, you've got a, an extractor that goes in the side here, and it's held in by this screw. And um, you know, there's there's your rolling block. That's very very basic. Very basic. It lasts it lasts forever. It hardly ever wears out. It's relatively safe for a single shot. It's relatively quick to load. A very strong action. Very strong. Well. You know, that's depending on the metal. Well, yeah, you know, I mean that's that's one of those things you can you can argue forever, because of the metal treatment and the metal uh, uh, ability to uh, um, what do I want to say um, control the heat treating and the alloy of the metal. The metal isn't terribly hard, and it isn't you know it's just steel. So. Is it a really tough action or isn't it? Well, for a black powder gun, it's going to last forever. Uh, the uh, Spanish uh, started out with the black powder cartridge, the 43 Spanish, and later on they went to the 7mm. Now, it wasn't exactly the same as the 7mm Mauser, but very close. The problem is that you buy them thinking they're a 7mm Mauser and then the bullet won't go in. <laughs> the cartridge won't go in. But, uh, you know, they're kind of marginal once you start getting into the uh, smokeless uh, rounds. So, uh, best if you're going to rebarrel them is to stick with black powder cartridges. To try and make a shooter out of it again by, by getting the, all the parts necessary to uh, put it back into shooting condition, some of them will be correct for this model. And some will not. Some will not. Yeah. I, I was lucky enough. I went to uh, uh, one of the parts sources and they had uh, an ejector. And this one, the ejector was broken in. Mm -hmm. So they had a, an extractor, whatever. Extractor, an extractor yeah. really. Uh, they had an extractor for the 1870 model. Now, how, <laughs> how lucky was that? Yeah. It just happened to have an extractor for, for the right model. Um, I'm, it's probably been sitting there for 50 years waiting for some yeah. silly guy. And, and the other thing, you know, to at least bring this to a shooter, we, we're, right now we're not cutting the barrel, so if we do ever find the parts, we may be able to return it. To exactly. Um, I would like to. I would love to return it to military. Yeah. And if turning I could, it into a shooter, we can see how good of a shooter it might be. Yeah. If there's good. other problems or, or things we need it'll to It'll be a lot of fun to... To uh, take it out and see whether or not what it'll do. Uh, the barrel, the, the bore is kind of, mm, yeah. it's okay. I mean, I've I've seen worse. It doesn't look like the craters of the moon or the sewers of Paris. Uh, it's just got a little hinky do here and there. Hinky do. <laughs> yeah, hinky do. Hinky do. Yeah, yeah. It's, that's it's that's a, a new uh, gunsmithing term. No, folks. no, no. This is an no, old, technical old, guns, old technical term. Old technical term. Old technical term. Okay. Yeah. Eighteen hundreds technical term. <laughs> yeah, you you may not have heard of it before. <laughs> hinky do. Exactly. Hinky do. <laughs> so um, yeah, we're, we'll try and bring this back uh, to shooting condition now, and we'll watch for parts. And if parts become available, I will take. I'll buy them as I can, and when we have them, we'll put it back together. Um, what do you think this was up here? That's uh, your uh, cleaning rod stop. Cleaning rod stop. It okay. had a ramrod with it, even though it wasn't a muzzleloader, mm -hmm. because it was kind of the muzzleloader era. So is, is that correct, or is somebody ground that down? Uh, as far as I know, it's correct. Okay. Uh, you can see the uh, there's a uh, in the original four that came for with like it. That. There yeah. was a channel for it. Yeah. Uh, for the cleaning rod or the ramrod or whichever you want to call it. It's not a ramrod because you're not going to ram a a ball down the, no, it's probably the bore, so it's really rod. a cleaning rod. Or a clearing rod. Or a clearing rod. That'll work. And um, anyway, it's a, it's an interesting piece of history. 
that uh, uh, we're going to make shoot and then we're going to uh, hopefully someday restore the military yeah. if we can find the parts. If we can find the parts, that would be that would be really interesting. Um, just to kind of give you an idea, some of the differences on this. Oh yeah, um, it's a this is a stock for a rolling block. Yes, this is a, I, I, I bought a rolling block stock, and you'll find them out there on the internet, and this is roughed out. There's a lot of wood to be taken off of it yet, but it kind of sort of fits, except that this uh, uh, lower tang is shorter than, than the a later standard ones. rolling block. Yeah, yeah the and, standard rolling box that came later. And that will show you one of the differences and why parts can be... Yes, I'll, so I'll have to put a plug in there and uh, then re-inlet uh, that part and try and blend it in the best I can. Uh, use a four in there. Uh, bought the four, uh, sporting four end also. That will get on, go on there when it's all uh, inleted. inleted and everything. And it's not inleted for the trigger guard at the moment. But uh, that'll, that'll go on there and uh, uh, if I don't know whether you can see it, but it's, there's a lot of wood to be uh, taken off of here and tapered and all that sort of thing. So there's there's a lot of work to be done on it yet, but uh, we will have a sporterized shooter uh, before this is over. As a matter of fact, all the uh, shooting, the parts to get it to shoot are there. Yep. Uh, it's a complete uh, barreled action, except for, I, as I said, mm -hmm. it had a broken extractor. And I bought some new screws for it because the screw heads on this have been so jammed up. And I got that little $40 part that'll sit right in there and hold those pins <laughs> in so they don't fall out. Yeah. Isn't that nice? So, yeah, and this is some stuff that you might find. And a lot of people, you know, grouse and complain about Mausers that were sporterized. You know, when you were growing up back in the 60s, how many uh, gun stores did you go into that had a barrel of barreled action oh, Mausers? Well, they had full all Mausers. It wouldn't but, just be you know, barrel action. Yeah, you could buy a full Mauser, but they 25 had... 25 bucks? Yeah, they had a barrel in the corner. Yeah, literally. But I, you can just I buy can, this. I can remember walking into Klein Sporting Goods in Hillside, Illinois, mm -hmm. right across from the Proviso West High School where I went to high school. Walked in there one day, and there was literally a barrel, a wooden barrel, full of Mausers. Mm -hmm. And it was complete. Well, there were some barrel actions, but mostly they were complete. And I remember at the time, I knew nothing, and I looked at it and I went, oh, I want that in 1871 because it's got the biggest bore. It was a black powder cartridge. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but so that was an 11 millimeter Mauser, you know, and then they had all the 8 millimeters, and I went, boy, that must be the elephant gun there. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's just going to show that you know, even back in the 60s when you, when they were sporterizing these things, they weren't necessarily starting with a complete rifle. Well, I mean, not could, always, yeah. Yeah, you know, for, for cheap, they could buy a barreled action, and you know, like we do with our ARs now, you buy a lower and an upper, and you just build them the way you oh, want yeah, to. Oh, yeah, you built it. You, you, you know, at the time, mm -hmm. there were two things that would you would never run out of. Mm -hmm. For the rest of your life, you knew there you would never run out of Mausers to sporterize because they made, like, 60 million of the things <laughs> worldwide and 30 out six ammunition surplus so, yeah, those so, two things would yeah. never run out <laughs> it couldn't possibly there was so much of it we, around yeah and we had so many 1911s <clears throat> in the inventory in the military they never thought they'd ever have to have another handgun no <laughs> uh they were going to go forever but yeah it's just you know times change we finally did use up all the mausers mm -hmm. all those 25 dollar so. mausers that people now say oh because at the time it was like bubble gum. Yeah. <laughs> and they could buy barreled actions for cheap if they wanted oh, to yeah. you know, really change things over. Oh, yeah. And, I mean, if you could buy the whole gun for 25 bucks, why would you buy a barreled action? Mm -hmm. You know, uh, I think the, the first Polish Mauser I bought was in 1970 or 71, right after I got out of the service. Uh, Montgomery Ward was closing their Chicago uh, uh, warehouse and they were advertising Polish Mausers for anywhere from 60 to 75 dollars and the first one i bought i bought a, a, a 60 dollar polish mauser that was the the gun i started learning to to work on mausers on. so that was now you know 16 1700 dollars yeah yep. i've uh, outlived my usefulness <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, I just thought we'd go over, you know, you know, sometimes you find stuff like this, and what do you do with it if you want to become a shooter? Because um, putting this back to military spec is a lifetime project. Well, just, more, to, more than just to hunt lifetime. down all the, the correct parts all for the, the 1870, yeah. because it was a one-off. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's 100 year, 150 years old. Mm -hmm. It's a one-off, one year, one year only. Uh, wasn't manufactured by Remington, manufactured by Springfield. For example, the rear sight's bit wrong. I mean, this is it's broken. It's broken. Yeah, uh, the, broken rear sight. The, the the base is right, but all that's on there is a, is a stub. Well, I'm going to have to, you know, Mickey Mouse something together mm -hmm. in order to have a rear sight on the gun. But uh, you know, until you but, can, and if you find your rear sight, it's going to cost you about a hundred and a half to hundred and seventy-five dollars. Maybe two hundred dollars. Yeah. Being being exactly. rare, maybe two or three. They're yeah. going to say, yeah, find another one. Yeah. <laughs> you well, need it, find another it's, one. It's like $40 for this little sheet metal part, you know. Okay. Well, I happen to have one. Mm -hmm. You happen to want one. And this is what I want for it. Yeah. Go find another one. Yeah. <laughs> it's, I'm sorry, but yeah, it's law of supply so, and demand. We'll, we'll, we'll probably revisit this one down the road as a sporter. Um, and I'm sure as he finds parts for it, he'll start putting stuff together. So... He can maybe bring it back to uh, military spec. It would be nice. It would be nice. This I would is like 45 to. Alpha Charlie Papa Channel. Uh, we do have shirts, t-shirt shop out there. And sweatshirts. Yeah, you know, we got sweatshirts and shirts. Um, you know, 45 Alpha Charlie Papa shirts. Um, this one's Give Cancer Both Barrels. This is more a kind of more feminine shirt, uh, kind of for the ladies out there. It's not all about you, you big lugs. You, know, you got to <laughs> think about your ladies too. Those were my wife's wife's uh, cowboy action cowboy guns, action guns. and I made her those holsters. Uh, so, so uh, and she passed away of cancer last October. Yeah. Uh, and if I haven't been very active, that's got a lot to do with it. We were married for fifty three years. And uh, getting used to life alone without somebody that's been with you since you were 20. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's tough. It's tough. So, thing. Anyway. So, well, this is 45 Alpha Charlie Papa Channel. And this and is the old singing gunsmith. And we got to sing Happy Trails, don't we? Do we have to sing Happy Trails? Well, that's the only one I know. Oh, okay. We'll sing well, you Happy can Trails. sing whatever you want, but you know. Well, I think. I can do the Bumpadadas. Bumpadadas? Happy trails to you until we meet again. Happy trails to you. Keep smiling until then. Have a good day. Good night, buttermilk. <laughs>